I just want to mention a few key points before I share some of the things that happened. I am not looking for attention. Everything contained within this story is 100% factual. I'm an Australian, and these occurrences happened on the central coast of New South Wales. I am an avid outdoorsman with a keen interest and in-depth knowledge of Australian native fauna. Each of these occurrences have a witness apart from myself. I don't claim these events are paranormal, yet I am, to this day, still without a reasonable explanation. Occurrence number one. I live on the New South Wales central coast in an area that has houses in close proximity to Brisbane Water National Park, literally within meters from some back fences. Myself and my partner hold a keen interest which sees us venture into the bushland regularly. For argument's sake, let's say we are avid bird watchers. A few weeks ago, the local fire service commenced backburning in parts of the Brisbane Water National Park over two days or so, which was obviously for hazard reduction. Most of the fire was directed at burning off leaf litter and dry debris, which covers the ground, in an effort to reduce the chances of spot fires, which have in the past become large fires and threatened houses and caused neighboring suburbs to be evacuated. Because of the way the back burning was controlled, it completely burned off the debris, and basically 90% of flora that was over two or so feet seemed to have survived, except for some light charring, of course. Even some grass plants survived while others were completely burned, including their underground roots, which left large round circles in the substrate. This meant that the canopy was fully intact, and this is an important point to the story. The fire was controlled so well that the left-hand side was completely obliterated by fire while the right-hand side was untouched. The path is about three to four feet wide at its widest points. Anyway, about 48 hours after the fire service had finished backburning, my partner and I ventured into a large patch of Brisbane Water National Park along a track that we have walked no less than 200 times in the last decade. The first thing we noticed, of course, was the lack of small shrubs and ground cover, which had been replaced by a 3 to 4 centimeter layer of ash. It was also hard not to notice the smell and non-visible smokiness which irritated our throats and noses, but by far the most profound thing we noticed was just how quiet it was. Usually we hear birds chirping, snakes slithering into the underbrush, lizards scampering out of the way, and ducks splashing around in the creek that runs along the whole length of the walking track on the right. Across the creek, there are literally kilometers of bush in all directions, so it was a little odd that it was so desolate, even after backburning. We decided to press on even though we were pretty sure that we weren't going to see any wildlife. We continued along the track for another 20 minutes or so, all the while chatting about nothing in particular, when all of a sudden we both jerk our heads to the left to see two vertical vines which stand at about six feet tall and four centimeters or so in circumference come toward us like they've been shook, held back and released, sort of like a slingshot. We immediately run over to the trees, four meters or so off the track, because we thought it might have been caused by wildlife. My first instinct was to look up, as it may have been a large bird fleeing, but there were no birds at all in any of the trees, and we would have seen and heard the wings flapping and it breaking through the canopy. It wasn't any type of guanas, we've only had two types which occur naturally here, and both are arboreal and will take to the nearest tree when threatened. We checked every tree, every hollow log and any type of ground cover which survived the fire and found nothing. It definitely wasn't any type of marsupial because it would have been spotted when we checked the trees and surrounding ground cover. It also wasn't any type of snake as the only arboreal snake we have locally which weighs in kilos is the diamond python 
which I could spot from a mile away. We continued walking for another three kilometers or so along the track, and the whole time felt like we were being watched. I was quite uneasy, but that feeling completely left as soon as we turned around and backtracked and headed toward home. Occurrences 2 and 3 My partner and I went out on another adventure, but this time we were looking for nocturnal animals to photograph. We went to a waterfall, which was only about 15 minutes from our house, but is rather secluded and completely dead at night and on weekdays. Funnily enough, it becomes packed on the weekends during the day in the warmer months. The layout of the waterfall is basically a large parking lot at the stop of the waterfall, which has a small park with barbecues, tables, and a small block of toilets. From the parking lot, you can also access the very top of the waterfall, which is basically a rock escarpment with water running through it. You can also access stairs that take you down to both the middle of the waterfall, which is just a huge rock platform, and the very bottom of the waterfall. It takes about 20 minutes to walk from top to bottom. We parked the car and I grabbed my gear, which included my camera. We start making our way toward the top of the falls, which has a two-foot barrier you have to step over to access the rock escarpment. Right as I went to put my leg over the fence, I heard the most disturbing noise I have ever heard. It sounded like a human, moaning in pain, but to describe it the best I can, imagine having ten different people with ten different voice qualities, all making the same moaning sound at the same time. I'm not one to frighten easily, but I have to admit, it sent chills up my spine. I told my partner to hurry up and get back to the car, and I locked the doors as soon as we got in and left in a hurry. Now, this place is pitch dark. There are zero lights, and there's no way in hell you'd be there without a torch. Not to mention, you would be able to tell if anybody was there by the cars parked in the parking lot, as this is not a place that you would walk to. When I told a close friend of mine, who also frequents the waterfall to photograph wildlife, he told me that he also had an experience the night before, which was the night after I was there. He had finished work late and thought he'd go for a quick walk around to see what he could find. This was in the Australian spring, when everything is out and about due to the warm and humid weather. He said he had parked his car and got about halfway down the stairs to the bottom of the falls when he came across a snake. He was photographing it when he heard the door of the toilet block being slammed repeatedly. He started running up the steps to get back to his car, and said as he was running up, it sounded like something was going mental, slamming things within the toilet block. He got in his car and left. My friend and I decided to go check out the waterfall that night to see if we could find anything. We parked the car and went straight to the toilet block. We checked the block that he had heard the commotion from and found a reasonably large amount of blood inside the basin and a small pool in the basin's soap dish. We contemplated calling the police but weren't sure exactly what we would report. We left soon after and neither of us visited the place for over a month. Since then we've been back to this place multiple times without any incident. Occurrence number four, the last occurrence. Now on to last night. We headed out along a road on the central coast, which by day is rather busy due to the high number of residences and farms that are along this road, but by night is usually very quiet, with a few cars using it sporadically, so I have my high beams on 95% of the time. We drove along this road for about 40 minutes in search of marsupials to photograph. This road intersects large masses of bush on both sides. I would also like to add at this point that this road is not straight or level by any means. There is a mixture of turns as well as slight to aggressive inclines and declines along basically the entirety of this road. After driving for 40 minutes without any luck, we decided to head back along the same route we would taken. We were driving for about 10 to 15 minutes on our way back when we hit one of the very slight gradual inclines along the road. When we were about halfway up the incline, I noticed something in the distance, maybe 200 to 250 meters or so, 
which I initially thought was a shadow being cast from residual lighting of my high beams. All of a sudden, it moved from the middle of the road to the right side. At this point, and while the figure was still in motion, I asked the passenger, and the person who's been present for the last three unexplained experiences, can you see that? To which they replied, yeah, what is that? We got to the top of the incline and onto level ground once again, and stopped in the location that we saw it. I stopped and I pulled out one of my torches and surveyed where we'd seen it. To my surprise, where it had crossed to was a small property which was essentially a house with a very small paddock with horses out in the front. But what caught my attention was that the horses were not startled in the slightest and could actually see one of them close to the fence, calmly eating. After about two minutes of surveying the area, I continued along the road and asked my passenger exactly what they had seen. They relayed exactly what I had seen. A tall, six-ish foot but with about two and a half foot wide profile but rounded figure. It was very hard to gauge an exact height because since we were on an incline, the perspective was a little off. For instance, say a person was to walk in that exact spot. We would only be able to see them from the knees up due to the blind spot on the summit. My passenger added another piece of information, which was that it was rusty colored. I couldn't make out a color, but I have to admit that I was not paying as much of attention to it as I was the road. I was going at about 70 kilometers an hour, so I really had to focus on driving while also trying to get to the summit as quickly as possible to see what it was. I would also like to add another detail, which I find is rather strange. While I couldn't see the figure's complete leg area, it didn't seem to be walking in a normal fashion. It's almost like it was gliding across the road. I know that seems odd. If I had to liken the body shape to a known animal, it would definitely without a doubt be an orangutan, but standing a fair bit taller and not as hunched in the lower back area. So there you have it. I no longer live in that area. I now live 40 minutes north of there, but I still visit often due to having family there. I would like to point out that all of these incidents happened within about a six week period, which all seemed to start with the hazard reduction backburning. Australian summers are harsh. I've not had any weird happenings since then, and I still spend a ridiculous amount of my time out in the bush. I also work in a scientific field. I work with wildlife, so I know which animals are endemic to Australia, and I know that what I saw is not. When I was four years old, I was living in Australia, Gold Coast to be exact. I don't remember much at all about that age, which is pretty normal, but there is this one thing that keeps coming back into my mind to this very day. This wasn't just some nightmare the kids usually have. I was wide awake, and I remember I felt everything that happened. I was put to bed by my parents sometime during the night. They left the room, and I was all by myself. I remember trying to fall asleep, but I was suddenly interrupted by some creepy figure. I remember being pulled off my bed and dragged underneath the bed by my arms. I couldn't move at all and I was unable to speak. I remember seeing this very dark figure with bright eyes holding on to me. From that point on, I can't remember what happened. I don't know what that was or how it even happened. I'm pretty sure it was some kind of sleep paralysis. But if you have any idea, let me know. This story happened about four years ago. I'm in my late 20s and so is my friend. It was around June in Toowoomba, Australia. My friend, let's call him Mark, asked me to come pick him up from his college, Downlands. June is when it gets coldest in Toowoomba, and that night I remember it reaching negative 4 degrees Celsius, or about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. It was around 6.30 when I reached the college. Mark is a teacher there, and apparently his car had stopped working. I wandered through the dark trying to find the admin block. I finally reached the block, and Mark was inside. He looked shaken up. I asked him what had happened. 
He said in a shaky voice, He's here. A ghost. We're at the school too late. He's been moving stuff. Now, as you can imagine at this point, I started to absolutely freak out. Dallin's is a boarding school, so I knew there was a small amount of people still there. However, the boarding block and admin block are far, far apart, and I was not about to wander through the dark pathways with Mark spouting the stuff that he was. Instead, I decided to go back to the car with him. So we locked up the office and cautiously walked out. We were blindly walking the concrete path in our thick jumpers. The wind was making an eerie howling noise as it started to blow gusts. Then I saw a flickering light, an orange light, coming from behind us. All of a sudden it got really warm, and I mean a quick sudden boost in temperature kind of warm. We were about halfway down this hill, so Mark and I turned around to see what was at the top of the hill. This still freaks me out when I think about it. It was a man on fire. He was standing there watching us. When we turned around, he stared at us for about five seconds, although it felt more like five hours. He then let out the most horrendous scream and started to run at us. Mark and I ran and fell over the side of the path. The man on fire ran past us, down the hill, and into the forest. I got up, and I looked down toward the oval, and he was still running. He just came out of the forest and was running toward the road, until both he and the fire vanished. At that point, we decided to run to the boarding block to find another member of the faculty. We reached the block, and we found one of Mark's colleagues. He let us stay the night. We were told that it was a really common thing to see if you stayed in the admin block too late, or if you were walking those paths at that time of night. Even from this block, everyone can hear his screams. At least once a week, they say. Apparently he terrorizes the school grounds at dark. The faculty member, who was also a teacher, said that he had only seen the burning man once. When I asked Mark the next morning what he had seen in the admin block, he said, all the drawers started to open, and I heard a voice say, The fire has been lit. When I first started to work here, the office ladies warned me that I shouldn't stay late near the building. Now I know why, he concluded. Before we left the next morning, we went to the admin block and asked the office ladies if they had ever seen him. We went in and saw a younger lady in her thirties. She asked, Do you have an appointment, Mark? No, he said. We just wanted to ask if you've ever seen... Then an older lady, maybe in her late 60s or early 70s, came out from the back and said, You two saw the burning man, didn't you? Mark replied, Yes, we did. We saw him last night. The old woman came closer and said, Yes, all the drawers were open. I've seen him many a time. Not a pleasant experience. Try not to stay late. And if you do, don't come anywhere near this building. The younger lady spoke up. I've seen him twice. I hated it. I've never stayed late again. We both left, and Mark got the day off. I never stepped foot on those school grounds ever again. My dad told me this story from when he worked in a nursing home in Australia. It spooked me a bit and I have no idea how he lasted as long as he did in that nursing home. For the record, my family are all skeptics, as far as I know. But I think this is the one story that would persuade me that ghosts are real. My dad worked the night shift, and he said that he had been told stories of deceased residents passing the front desk on the bottom floor. He said he even heard babies crying on the top floor. The nursing home used to be a maternity hospital. This crying would occur even though there was now no maternity clinic near it. There was a TV room on the bottom floor. It was on this floor where some of the residents who were kept in bed all night for their own safety were housed. He moved the chairs near the TV all the way back to the wall and locked the door. He came back an hour or so later whilst waiting for the porter and the door was open and one of the chairs was moved back across to the television. The door hadn't been forced, 
There were no windows in the room, and even if there were, the chair was too heavy to be blown back across the room. All the patients were accounted for. The porter arrived, and my dad asked him about the occurrence. The porter said, Oh yeah, that's Bob's chair. He doesn't like it to be away from the TV. My dad said, There is no Bob at this nursing home. The porter chuckled and said, There used to be. He's dead now. That's my dad's one and only experience with ghosts, and it chills me to the bone. I have quite a few stories I could tell, but I decided to start with this one, because I think it illustrates a few things about me and my now husband. It was also the first time I really saw a ghost, right in front of me, rather than in my peripheral vision. I think I may be a bit of an empath, judging by the experiences that I've had over the last 50 odd years. My husband, Jay, however, is a skeptic. He says he would love to see a ghost, but doesn't expect to. He once took part in a study at a university, one of those classic guess which card I'm holding up experiments. This was in the 70s. Jay got so many wrong that it was statistically significant in the negative direction. He says that proves that there's no such thing. I think it indicates the opposite. I believe he actively blocks his own abilities to the point where he negates the paranormal around him. Being around him is like wearing psychic earplugs. It's very soothing. The following occurred in the early 80s when we were at university in northern New South Wales, Australia. Most of the students lived on campus and the university had its own radio station to cater to them. A friend of ours, Gail, was a DJ at the time and had a midnight till dawn weekend shift. She invited us up to the station one night to tape some albums from the station's record collection. The radio station was located in a faculty building, about a 20 minute walk from the college where we all lived. Gail had the keys and locked all the doors behind us. The station consisted of two rooms, a large rectangular room housing an office area with two glass walled studio booths partitioned off on one long side and a storage room housing the library. The entrance door was in the long wall opposite Studio A. The door to the library was in the short wall next to Studio B. Other than the library, the entire area is visible from either of the two studios. Gail commenced her shift using Studio B, while Jay set up in Studio A with some blank cassette tapes and I headed into the library to pick some albums. The record library was fantastic. Four walls of floor-to-ceiling shelving, packed solid with classic rock LPs. I was standing on a chair, choosing some music from the top shelf, when I started feeling that there was someone, or something, behind me. Almost, but not quite touching me. I was telling myself not to turn around, that there's nothing there, and so on. But the feeling got so strong that I really wanted to get my back against the wall, I have personal space issues, and the sensation of anything being that close was just too much for me and I had to get out of there. I grabbed a couple of records, took them to Jay, and then I went to talk to Gail in Studio B. From where I was sitting, facing Gail who had her back to the main room, I could see the entire radio station. Jay was in the studio to my right, and the main door was diagonally to my right. The one and only door to the record library was diagonally to my left, all clearly visible through the glass walls of the studio booths. I watched Jay get up, leave Studio A, walk across the office space from right to left behind Gale and enter the record library. As he disappeared into the library, a figure in blue came out of the library door, crossed rapidly from left to right behind Gale, and entered Studio A. I turned my head to look directly into Studio A, but nobody was there. About 15 minutes later, Jay came out of the record library and walked back to Studio A. Immediately, the blue figure shot out of Studio A, crossed behind Gail and went back into the library. Gail must have seen my eyes following it because she said, quite excitedly, You saw it, didn't you? I knew if there really was something here you would know. It turns out that Gail had been feeling like she wasn't alone up there at night and having heard some of my experiences, she decided to try an experiment. 
She kept her experiences to herself and then waited to see if I picked up anything. Gee, thanks, Gail. It also turns out, I guess, that while Jay ain't afraid of no ghost, the ghosts seem to be afraid of him. I've always been a big fan of ghost stories and spooky things, but I've never had a story happen directly to me. I've always wanted to or have been excited by experiencing these things. I've just never had an incident that has made me fully commit to saying I've had a ghost experience. However, I usually ask people that I'm comfortable with, do you have any ghost stories? Most of the time I hear some pretty great stories. I have a lot from family and some crazy ones from my girlfriend who I think is like the boy from the sixth sense. I'm generally quite a skeptic but I have fun getting a spooky story nonetheless. Last night when I was at work, I asked my boss if he has any ghost stories. He said that he did. He told me this story whilst cleaning up the bar that he owns. I can only take it as truth as he admitted to me that he's still somewhat skeptical about it all, but the more he thinks about it, the more he thinks it was a ghost encounter rather than just a strange occurrence. This is a story that he retold to me while we both admitted to getting goosebumps. My boss Tom was living in the UK and was moving out to Sydney, Australia to work on a big project that required long round the clock hours. This included working primarily in front of his laptop. Tom's wife's stepsister owned a house here in Sydney that was located in a rather old timey area near the ports and docks. The stepsister was going away for a while and offered her townhouse for Tom to stay in whilst he was working on this crazy busy project. So he flew out and stayed there by himself. The main bedroom was located on the top floor of the townhouse. At the far end of the room, there was a slant in the roof that only gave a small amount of distance to the floor and the roof. So the designers made a built-in wardrobe to make use of the awkward space. The bed was situated near the doors of these wardrobes, though I don't know how far. One night when Tom was asleep, he was woken up by the sound of deep sobbing. He woke up in a panic and was thinking that it was possibly a fox, as they roughly make the sound of a crying baby at times. The tone was kind of low and made him think that it was a man. He also noticed that the cries were coming from the wardrobe area, which also backed into the wall that was shared with the neighbors. Not thinking much about it, he thought maybe the neighbors were having a rough night and he tried to sleep again. This happened again the next night, and then the night after that. Eventually, Tom was woken up by the sobbing sound and started to get more suspicious of it rather than ignoring it. He sat up in bed and was looking at the wardrobe doors in the dark. He heard the cries for a moment until one of the wardrobe doors popped open right at the moment that he was sitting up paying attention to them. Tom jumped out of bed at this sight and raised his fist in the air, getting ready to punch or defend himself at whoever came out of it. But no one did. Nothing did. He stood there for a moment, then grabbed his bag and hurried downstairs. Tom, sitting in the lounge room downstairs, got his things and prepared for the day and decided to stay at a friend's house for the remaining days he had in Australia because he was getting too spooked to go and sleep there another night. Trying to be rational about it, Tom thought that maybe the things in the wardrobe were pushed up against the door and it just popped open. The more he thinks about it though, the more he thinks about how strange it was. He never spoke to his stepsister about it, out of embarrassment, I guess. Years later, they were at a family function and he was talking to her about the time he stayed there and asked her about her neighbors and who lived next door. The stepsister said to him that the next door house had been unoccupied since she bought the place. Nobody was living there. I have strong reason to believe that Tom was telling the truth in this story, as you just tell when people are trying to get a rise out of you, you know? Or tell the best story in town? This just wasn't the case. Either way, after hearing that story, I just had to share it. This story happened many years ago, around the months of June and July. My family and I often go up and vacation at a cabin in Yungaburra, Cairns, Australia during the winter. We do this as we miss the cold days that we would get from our hometown of Toowoomba during the winter as Cairns is tropical, 
so it's summer 24-7. Yungabura is a very, very small town that resides on top of a hill. It's one of those towns that if you blink, you'll miss it. However, it's quaint and friendly. It's historical, with about 150 or more years of heritage. As usual with rich heritage and small towns, local folk legends from over the years accumulated. One of these legends ended up coming true. We rented this cabin that was on the brink of bushlands, and it was next door to an old farmhouse that has quite a bit of land, including some of the bushland the cabin backed onto. To get to the cabin, you had to walk up a somewhat steep dirt road that also leads to the aforementioned farmhouse. The dirt road also had a medium-sized pond that ran along it. This dirt road came off one of the main streets of Yungaburra. Anyway, on our last night staying there, I went to the pub to see one of my good friends who lives in Yungaburra. I had to drive early the next morning, so I didn't have a drop of alcohol. He, on the other hand, did not have anywhere to drive the next morning, so he pretty much drained the pub. It got to about 11.30 and I decided that I'd better get back to the cabin to go to sleep. The cabin was only a 15 minute walk, so after saying my goodbyes, I started to walk back. As I was walking, I realized that not driving was a dumb idea, as it was about 5 Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. I had a very thin jumper on and that was it. As I continued to walk on, it grew colder and I started to shiver big time. I finally reached the entrance to my driveway and God did it look ominous. There were no street lights leading along the dirt road, so it was pitch black. I decided to get out my phone and turn the flashlight on. It was at this point that I knew something was very wrong. After I turned my flashlight on, fog started to roll in. At first it was only light fog, but it continued and developed into heavy fog, and then it surpassed heavy fog, and then I could barely see my shoes below me. All I could see was white in front of me. I said to myself, well, here we fucking go, something's about to happen, get it over and done with. My flashlight was now rendered superfluous. I decided to stop walking as I knew that there was a steep ditch with a pond at the bottom and the last thing I wanted was to fall into it. As I stood there, only getting colder and even more terrified, I saw a lantern in the distance, a small amber light coming down the driveway. Then I heard, son? Is that you? Come here out of the fog, follow the lamp. It was my mom. I couldn't yet see her, so instead I followed the light. I continued to follow it for about three minutes, safely walking up the dirt driveway. I saw the light climb up the steps and I heard the door open, so I knew that I was near the cabin. Then the light went out. I continued to walk in the direction that I had seen it last, I was calling out for my mom to turn it back on, and there was no reply. I finally ran into a wooden guardrail, literally, and some steps. I walked up the steps, and instantly my knees felt weak. They had turned to jelly. I wasn't home. I was on the doorstep of the old abandoned farmhouse. The door was there, swaying open in the gentle wind, making a sinister creaking noise along with it. There are three things you do in this type of situation. The three F's, if you will. Flight, fight, or freeze. And I was frozen to the core. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn around and find my way back. I was definitely not stepping foot inside that house. I was stuck. I then heard a voice coming from inside the house. My son, welcome home. Nasty weather, hmm? The voice no longer sounded like my mom's. It had a prominent British accent. It was then that I realized I would rather be out in the fog than standing on the doorstep of this house. I quickly walked down the stairs. I heard the voice now yelling, my son, where are you going? I started to sprint, but as I was running, I smashed my foot and leg against some sort of stone and fell flat onto the ground. It took a chunk out of my knee and I had cuts all along my hands. I still have some scars from it. 
I turned around and realized that I had not tripped over a stone. Well, not any stone. I had tripped over a tombstone. At this point I screamed, got up, and started to run even more. I was screaming for my parents and started to slow down to a jog. I stopped. I thought that I got far enough away from the house. Until, little amber lights, at least six of them, started to surround me. They started to come closer. I found a gap between them and ran for it. Yet again, I felt like I was sprinting for my life. It was like I was in a race, but the metal at the end was just my life. Before I knew it, slam, I ran straight into a wall with my head being the contact point. I blacked out, and from what I can remember, I was woken up by my dad who heard something smack into the cabin. Apparently, when he went out to get me, he saw one little amber light flickering near the farmhouse through all the fog. That was the end of my night, and any vacation near that cabin. We decided not to leave early the next morning to give me some time to rest. This also gave me time to ring up my friend so he could come over, and perhaps give me some insight into what I had experienced and what my dad saw. He and I sat out on the patio. I could see the farmhouse, only about 500 meters away. It looked old and desolate. This is the folk legend, according to him. Apparently, back when the small town was first being founded, that farmhouse was one of the first ones built, late 19th century, during the 1910s or something. A well-known mother, Anne was her name, had let her son play with some of his mates down on the main stretch of town one day. It started to get late, and as it got later, Anne grew more worried. Then, heavy fog started to roll in. She decided to get her kerosene lamp and go looking for him. As she walked down, she could hear his footsteps, and she told him to follow the lamp. When she made her way back to the house, she was not accompanied by her son. It wasn't until the next morning that they found him dead in the bottom of the pond. He had hit his head hard and died instantly. The grave is apparently that of her son's. The mother apparently searches for her son on winter nights and lures males from the pub on late, cold, dark nights, mistaking them for her own lost son. The young Abura fog is one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. I've gotten used to generic things, stuff moving, stuff missing, shadows, all that sort of thing. So I wanted to share something truly unique that happened to me. I've worked for the Disneyland Hotel for over a year. I work in one of the many departments that would need to deliver things from our department to the guest rooms whenever a guest needed them. One night at around 11.30 p.m., I was making a delivery when I heard a group of children laughing from the pool deck, which is surrounded by a gate. Since I was headed to a guest room and they had been given a wait time so they knew when to expect me, I didn't stop to see who was playing in the pool, and to check that they were at least being monitored by an adult. After delivering what the guest needed to the room, I headed back to where I was supposed to be waiting when I heard more children laughing from the pool deck, as well as some splashing. Since the pool water itself is well lit and the pool deck is poorly lit, I expected to at least be able to see some kids playing in the pool and something resembling an adult within easy hearing range. By the time I had walked up to the gate, which is covered in plants, the laughing and splashing had stopped, and I could see that there was no one anywhere near the pool or the pool deck. It really makes me wonder what I heard. While I know that there have been deaths at the hotel and in its rooms, most recent deaths happening weeks before this posting. All of the deaths have been adults, making me wonder why I was so sure of what I was hearing. I've also been deaf in my left ear since childhood, so any sounds that I did hear would have had to have been very, very loud. I'm still not sure how to explain that experience. In November of 2016, my family takes me to Disneyland. We stay at an Airbnb, the whole deal. We go back to Disneyland the same day, 
at 11 o'clock at night, trying to make the most of our money. I walk through the gates, and everything goes silent. I hear the stuffed animals that people walk past me with, saying, Help me, they're going to kill me. As soon as I walk through, clear as day, I saw and felt a world of genocide. People on the floor, middle of the day, crows picking at their bodies, everybody on the balconies, without eyes. I thought that I was the only one left on earth. Thirty seconds later, it was over. I never saw it again, and I never told my family. If anyone has any experiences or answers, please tell me. This is by far the scariest thing that I've experienced. Where my boyfriend used to live, at his mom's, he's moved out now. It was like a new build complex. Lots of new houses and roads, like its own little village. Built around a mental asylum. They knocked the majority of it down, but what remained was the administrative building, church, and a large garden. We'd walk the dogs in the garden at night, and I always got feelings in there, kind of in my shoulders, like something was behind me, or watching me. It never felt malicious, but it creeped me out all the same. Being the adventurous people we are, we decided to explore the administrative building, so we gathered a few friends and headed off. This was during the day, as it was guarded at night. Getting inside involved lots of climbing through windows and up scaffolding. Once in, we split off and explored, but it was in such a state of ruin we didn't get too far. I found some stairs down to another floor and stood there for a while. I heard footsteps up the stairs and did a runner. I told the guys and they were on the other side of the building, so it definitely wasn't them. We kept hearing doors slamming, but it was a calm and sunny day. Thoroughly creeped out, we left and just explored the grounds and some of the other smaller buildings. When we got home, I was absolutely exhausted, like really drained, but I didn't think much of it. The next night, I was back at home and settling down to sleep, but I couldn't get comfortable. I could feel something watching me from the end of my bed. I tossed and turned, trying to ignore it, but I could feel it, staring. I got really upset and started crying, it was so intense. I then got a thought that passed through my mind. You came to stare at me, so I'm staring at you. I bolted into my parents' room next door and told them. They calmed me down, and when I went back to bed, it was gone. Another time, we were in the garden late at night with a friend, and as usual, I could feel something there. My boyfriend and his friend were facing toward me, and I was facing them. At the other end of the garden, I saw what looked like arms and the tops of legs, walking behind a sort of archway in the garden. It was almost see-through white, and walked for about five seconds before I told the guys. Of course, it wasn't there when they turned around. The garden has got high walls all around it, so it definitely wasn't a car, and there was no one else there. That place is definitely haunted. I did some research, and the residents at the unit used to visit the garden and spend a lot of time there. They weren't treated well, and they still used all the old-fashioned treatments for mental health and learning disabilities. We haven't been back since, as my boyfriend doesn't live with his mom anymore, like I mentioned. I have always experienced the paranormal, and I'm definitely open to sensing spirits. Honestly, being followed, though, was the scariest thing I've ever been through. This happened back in 2009. I was a freshman in high school, and had never experienced anything truly paranormal until that one night. I went up to hang out with my best friend at the time and his girlfriend. We all lived within walking distance of each other, just to give you an idea of how close we were. I was almost never home, because quite frankly, I didn't want to be there due to my abusive stepfather. Nothing paranormal about that, though. 
Our new favorite game that we all like to play was hide and seek in the dark, or some people may refer to it as manhunt. I know different games are played differently and called different things depending on where you're from. We had played that there so many times during the day that we all knew the essential hiding locations, and it almost wasn't fun anymore. At night, we wouldn't use any flashlights or any sort of aid. It made it more challenging and fun. You could use the shadows and dark spots to your advantage. So long as you were concealed, you were pretty much set. My favorite spot to hide was along the one side of his house, where no light could pass through. I would lay down flat behind a few shrubs, and it was a good spot, until they started to catch on. It was my time to seek, and everyone was finally hidden. Another fun part we added in was that you could change your hiding spot during any point of time, and if you were en route, the person who was it would have to tag you. Pretty common rules. This was my first time seeking at night, and I didn't realize how hard it was until then. I checked the dark part of the house first. I went to every spot I could think of, and I couldn't find anyone. I started to get anxious because it was taking longer than I thought it should have. I started to go toward the other side of the house and began to walk down towards their garage. I was trying to be quiet, hoping I could hear some sort of rustle or movement. Then I saw my opportunity. A human-shaped shadow began to move across my friend's house. I got extremely excited and shouted, Isaac, I've got you. And as I reached out to grab him, the shadow moved in front of his open garage door, and nothing was there. I opened my fist and began to immediately shake with fear. I called out to my friends, both of which were nowhere near the area, and told them what happened. We were all spooked, to say the least, and then we all stopped again, dead in our tracks. The boy figure was now sitting with his face in his hands on his neighbor's porch. We all saw it. He then got up and ran around the corner, disappearing from our sight. We all agreed to end the game there and then. A very bad storm started to roll in. I said goodbye to my friend and I went with his girlfriend to her house for a sleepover. She always told me her house was haunted, which I believe, mainly because of the nasty vibe I got when I walked into her house. To make it worse, she offered to play with her Ouija board, which I had never heard about before then. I asked her, does it really work? To which she responded, do you want to find out? So us, being stupid teenagers, decided to use it. This is how every bad horror movie starts with Ouija boards. Again, I was unaware of the risks until after the fact. The board was a glow-in-the-dark version, just one that her mom had gotten her from a local bookstore. We went out into her hallway upstairs, which was very small to begin with. It was just wide enough for a single person to walk through. We sat next to each other with the board in between us. We turned the lights out and it was pitch dark, other than a little sliver of light that was coming from her sister's bedroom. We began asking questions, but the board wasn't moving. I was about to call it quits when I looked over at my friend and noticed something strange down the hall. Her parents' door was shut, and on the door they had a long mirror hanging up. In front of the mirror, I saw the same boy from hide-and-seek, except now he was rocking back and forth with his head between his legs. I immediately threw my hand up and turned the light switch on and ended the session. When I looked to the floor next to me, there were two very large boot prints embedded into the carpet. I never spent the night, and I never wanted to again after that. Throughout all of this, I kept hoping that maybe we were just seeing our own shadows, and that our eyes were playing tricks on us in the dark, but I hardly think so. All of us still remember that to this day, and that happened ten years ago. That was just the first spiritual encounter I had, followed by many more to come. 
Another creepy thing about her house that I thought I would mention. On the ceiling above the staircase, it looked like there were multiple hand streaks in the paint that led all the way up the stairs. Their parents had tried to paint over it many times, but they would continually reappear. They looked like the handprints could have belonged to that of a small child. This happened several years ago. I live in southwest Missouri, and there are a lot of rural areas, as well as some larger cities pretty close together. This happened on a two-lane highway going through some of the rural areas. This part of Missouri has a lot of hills, and the road I was driving on was no exception. It was between 8 and 9 p.m., and my wife and I were driving down this dark highway doing about 55 to 60 miles per hour. Most of the hills are pretty gentle, but most of them are also blind, as in you can't see the traffic on the opposite side. We crested one such hill in an area of mostly farmland, with the closest house being a quarter of a mile or so. And as we did, there were these long legs crossing the road a foot or two from the driver's side of my car, I honestly only saw the legs and a bit of waist, nothing above that. Given that I was going at a pretty good speed and it was dark, it was hard to see any more. But we both clearly saw this. It happened so fast, I didn't have time to swerve or honk the horn. If this had been a real person, I would have killed them. I heard nobody yelling at me to slow down, no noise at all, and there was nothing in the rearview mirror. The odd thing is, there would be no reason for anybody to be walking on a blind hill out in this area, as there are no houses close by, and no mailboxes in this immediate area. My wife was spooked and said, what the hell was that? I said that it looked like disembodied legs, and we both agreed. We went back in the daytime and still could see no reason for somebody to be there, and no signs of anything unusual. Both sides of this road are bordered by barbed wire fence and weedy, steep ditches, so it's not easy to walk along. The other thing that makes me think it wasn't of this world is if it had been a living human, they would have heard my car coming half a mile away, as this is a very quiet area, and sound travels well out in the country. No sane person would stand on a blind hill knowing a car is approaching doing at least 55. To this day, I still wonder what the hell we saw. Years ago, when I was around 10 at the time, I was sleeping in bed when my brother Sam shouted for me. When I sleepily made my way out to the other room where he was using the computer, he asked me why I kept creeping in and out of the room behind him and ignoring him when he asked me what I was doing. The computer is by a window, so you can clearly see the reflection of the room at night. Sam said that he could see me in the reflection, messing around behind him. I insisted that I hadn't been up for a few hours, and that he was just trying to scare me. But Sam insisted that he saw me. A couple of months apart from this story, another thing happened. Sam and I shared a room while my own bedroom was being redecorated. I was on the high bunk and slam <laughs> I was on the high bunk and Sam slept below. I was a pretty light sleeper. I saw the bedroom door open and I saw him leaving. I asked if he could bring me a glass of water as I had a dry throat. He paused, said nothing, and continued to leave. He never came back in. When morning came, I was going to ask him about it, but he wasn't on his bed. I couldn't find him in the house either, so I asked my parents where he'd gone, and it turned out that entire night he was having a sleepover at a friend's house. He wasn't even home. It dawned on me then that I had remembered he left around dinner time the day before. I told my parents that somebody opened my bedroom door and stood there, but they just said I was seeing things. At the time I saw the figure, I was very tired, and it was really late at night. I'd clearly forgotten that Sam wasn't home, so I thought nothing of it at the time. 
But given the fact that it seems we both saw each other's doppelgangers, it creeps me out to this day. I've lived with ghosts my entire life. Well, at least I've lived with the idea that I was never really alone. Growing up, I always heard stories about my mom's experiences, seeing things in mirrors behind her and being visited by a loved one the night before I was born. Of course, I always took those kinds of stories with a grain of salt, until I started having my own experience. I grew up in a small co-op apartment in the suburbs of Queens, New York, and when I say suburbs, I mean 15 minutes away from the nearest subway station. We lived on the second floor, so we had access to an attic which was full of relics from the 40s and 50s. Over the years, the attic quickly filled up with all of our stuff to the point where it was next to impossible to walk up there. My first experience came in the form of unexplained noises. The sound of small feet, presumably children, running across the attic floor would keep me up at night, as the attic door was located right outside my bedroom door. Oftentimes, the sound of a rubber ball bouncing would accompany the running. After a while, I got used to the noises and quickly resorted to shouting, shut it, and the noises would stop. The next occurrence was on a sunny summer afternoon. My mom had just told me to take the trash out, and I gave her an okay while I finished playing up a video game. I hear the door lock, or unlock, I'm not sure which, and I assumed it was my mom. My game finishes and I go to ask my mom if she took the trash out and that I would have done it. She tells me that she thought I did it because she also heard the door locks move. Needless to say, we were shook. The running has now turned to boots stomping in the attic and shut it isn't cutting it this time. Moving forward to my first time in the house alone for an entire week as my mom was out of town. As a kid, I was scared shitless of the dark, as most of us are. Naturally, I kept all the lights on before bed. One night, as I was eating my dinner, I heard the floor creak from the living room. I didn't think much of it, as an old house is bound to make these noises from time to time. That's when I heard the voice of a woman as clear as day, humming a song. This scared the ever-living crap out of me, and you can bet I slept with the lights on. This would also be the first time that I heard a voice, but it wouldn't be the last. Fast forward to a few months back. I'm home from college for one of the few breaks I get. We're now in a townhouse in upstate New York. We also adopted a puppy we named Louie. It was my understanding that the ghostly occurrences had stopped when we moved out of the old co-op. My mind changed during that school break. Unfortunately, about a month prior, my father had passed away and was cremated. I keep his ashes with me wherever I go. They currently sit next to my bedside. My mom had told me that she had seen the silhouette of a man in my doorway when I wasn't home. I assumed it was my dad and thought nothing more of it, until the night that we changed the smoke detector batteries. As you may know, a smoke detector beeps quite loudly when the batteries are low, so I got up on a ladder and took it down to change them. I did so and put it back up, pressing the test button to make sure everything was good to go. Upon doing so, my mom claimed to hear a woman's voice, which I did not hear for myself. Seconds later, a huge bang came from downstairs, in the kitchen, to be exact. Poor Louie was barking at whatever had caused the sound. My mom and I cautiously made our way down, to find that the house phone we had positioned on the far wall on a windowsill had flown across the room, still plugged into the wall. We didn't know what to make of it, as it didn't make sense for there to be some sort of power surge that would cause it to literally travel three feet across the room. No other electronics were affected, just that one. This was by far the most violent unexplained experience we have ever had. Last night, 
things got weirder. I'm home for summer break, and it's been months since the phone incident. Louis, who is now much older and isn't as jumpy as he was when he was a pup, randomly started growling and barking into the darkness past my mom's bedroom door. I was in the basement watching a horror movie, which made the situation worse to say the least. I ran up upon receiving a text from my mom to grab Louie. When I got up there, the fear on this poor dog's face was unsettling. And when I picked him up and moved him around, he had his eyes locked onto something that was still located right outside my mom's door. This has never happened with him before, and I'm still not sure what to think of it. The presence that has been following us around for years is seemingly getting more and more aggressive. My mom carries around these evil eye things. I'm not sure what exactly they're called, but they're blue and white colored bead things that are painted to look like eyes. She has them all over the house, and a lot of the times they break with no explanation, even when they're brand new. Whether or not you believe any of this is up to you, but we're not really sure what's going on or why it followed us. To start out, I'm fairly skeptical of the paranormal, so I don't really know what to believe. But the only stories that are even a little bit similar to what I experienced all seem to be paranormal. So to give some backstory, my street and neighborhood are pretty quiet, especially at night due to the number of young families and elderly couples that live on my street, which makes staying up into the early hours of the morning more relaxing and also a bit cooler, knowing that I'm most likely the only person on my street that's awake. The only thing is that I've had some creepy experiences like hearing noises or even seeing a few drug deals, but most of that can be chalked up to living next to a big forest with lots of wildlife or just some sketchy neighbors. But for the past week, I have been trying to find a logical explanation for the strange events that keep occurring. It started at 2 a.m. last Tuesday morning. I was just sitting in bed on my phone with my earbuds in, something I do almost every night. When I began to hear whistling coming from out my window, I took my earbuds out and began listening to the whistling trying to come up with an explanation. Normally I'm not scared by anything in my neighborhood this late, and to be honest I get more excited that something's happening and I'm there to witness it. But this time felt different. I wanted so badly to get up, to look out my window, but I was almost paralyzed with fear. I don't know what came over me, but every minute that went by of this whistling, I felt the pit in my stomach growing larger. It went on for almost an hour, and for the entire hour I waited for that whistling to start a tune or a song I could look up, but it just kept whistling the same note in a strange pattern. It would whistle one note for a good minute, and then take a break for about 30 seconds, and then return with its one minute whistle until about 20 minutes in, when the whistles got shorter and closer together, only to return to the original pattern after about 10 minutes. What was even stranger was that whatever it was, was pacing in front of mine and my neighbor's house up until it stopped and retreated back down the other side of the street. I heard it leave, and I almost immediately felt that pit in my stomach subside, and while I was confused, I decided I should just go to sleep before I scared myself even more. The next day, I asked my parents and even some of my friends that live close by if they'd ever heard anything like that. Everyone assumed it was an animal, which made me feel a lot better, but I wanted a definite answer of what I had heard. I stayed up for hours that night, researching types of animals that were local to my area and the noises that they made. I didn't find anything that matched. This only left me more frustrated that I had no clue what it was, so I continued staying up in hopes that I would hear it again, and that this time I would look out my window to see it. But with my luck, I never heard the whistling again, except lots of other weird things have been happening. After the whistle, I began hearing someone or something walking around in mine and my neighbor's driveways 
and sometimes even our yards, very late at night. But whenever I go to check, I can't see anything. And then about two nights ago, I swear I saw a figure of a person lurking behind my neighbor's car. Then the night after that, I saw what looked like a flashlight in the woods near my house, and whatever it was that was holding the flashlight was running out of the woods. Then again last night, I saw a person crouching near my neighbor's car, just looking around. I thought I was done researching. I couldn't find anything about any animals, but now I've started researching any stories even close to mine, hoping that I'm either not alone, or even better, someone has the answer to the strange occurrences, because I would like to start sleeping at a more normal time again, and not be worried about either a stalker or a poltergeist or something coming to get me in my sleep. I'm just very confused, and no one seems to believe me so any insight would be greatly appreciated. Even just knowing that at least someone is listening is helpful. When my mom was younger, about six years old, she and her dad had fallen asleep on the couch. She was laying in front of him, so his back was facing the back of the couch, and my mom had her back toward him. She'd woken up in the middle of the night to see somebody sitting in front of her, leaning against the couch. At first she thought it was her dad, so she reached her hand out to touch him. But all she could feel was really curly hair, like an afro, which her dad didn't have. She ripped her hand away immediately, knowing that it couldn't be anybody in her family. That's when she saw it start to turn its head, but before they could make eye contact, it disappeared. Creepy enough, right? Well, get this. My dad had a similar experience. When he was young, he was laying in his bed and had also been woken up in the middle of the night. The entity was sitting in the same position, sitting up with his or her back against the side of the bed. My dad thought it was his dog, so he went to pet him and felt the same curly, textured hair. He immediately ripped his hand away and kicked it in the head, but it popped right back up, and he just kept kicking it, and then it disappeared. When my dad met my mom, they'd been sharing their paranormal encounters, and as my dad was listening to my mom tell her story and describe what she had seen and felt, my dad got this overwhelming feeling and immediately knew that when they were kids, years before they had ever met each other, they had encountered the same entity. This happened a few years ago when I was in a taxi. I lived near a haunted road at the time. I was in the front seat and there were three women and a little girl in the back seat. The drive was pretty quiet, but the strangeness happened when the car stopped to let two of the women out. The driver collected the fare from the ladies and noticed that the little girl was no longer in the car. We all looked around and she was just nowhere to be found. There was silence for a moment before I told the driver to just go. The location where we stopped had no bushes or buildings to hide behind, just a bus stop. If she had snuck from the car to avoid payment, she would have had to run at least 100 to 150 meters in either direction and do that silently in less than 10 seconds. I really doubt that's possible unless she is the most legendary ninja. What confuses me is if she was a ghost, how did the women in the back not notice? Maybe she had an actual physical form? If it's not a ghost, then any ideas on what could have happened? I am still thoroughly confused. So, about a year or two ago, I was living in Dekula, Georgia with my older foster sister, who is 40, and five other foster siblings. My older foster brother, who is the same age as me, had started to tell me all about this ghost spirit that he had summoned. To let everybody know ahead of time, my foster brother was really into reading the Bible, and he wanted to become a preacher since we were really little. But one year, that all changed, and he began to show some very strange signs. Firstly, he wasn't into reading the Bible anymore. Even when I mentioned to him how he had told us he wanted to be a preacher, 
he would deny he ever said that. Also, he had started to call himself the devil, and he told me how he wanted to watch the world burn. And yes, this was happening when we were in our teenage years, but I'm saying that I know he wasn't emo or just playing a joke. Anyway, moving on to the summoning of ghosts, between 2016 and up to August of 2018, my foster brother would continuously mention this ghost spirit. The spirit's name was Chris. Apparently, my foster brother told me that he had found out how to summon him through a website, probably something off the dark web. He told me that this ghost was a war soldier that had died in one of the world wars, and that he had left his wife and children to go and fight the war. Throughout 2016, even through 2018, I was kind of believing him. There were a few times when at night I would be sleeping in bed, and I felt like somebody was in my room, like hiding in a corner or being at the end of the bed. And there were also times where we could hear small creaks upstairs when everybody was downstairs. Honestly, I don't think he was trying to troll us or just doing it to get attention. I honestly just have no clue. I was six years old at a funeral, and I was just wandering around the church. Then this kid, who was about the same age as me, urged me to go into this basement to play with him. I used to keep Hot Wheels in my pockets, so we passed a car back and forth to each other on this weird table. Looking back now, it was probably the table a mortician used. He didn't talk much, but he was really hyper. He tossed the car really hard and it went off the table. I didn't want to catch it. As soon as he did that, it was like he dipped off into a corner. But I couldn't see him leave because I was looking for my Hot Wheel. I didn't hear any footsteps going back up or anything. He just vanished. I'm pretty sure I played with a ghost. So like six years ago, I lived in Orange Park, Florida, and our house had mold throughout it, so we had to move. I lived in that house my whole life, and I was really distraught at the thought of leaving it. Eventually, my dad and stepmom got my brother and I excited about the house that we had to move to, so we moved all of our stuff in. It wasn't a huge house. It had three bedrooms and an office, so it doesn't seem like the typical scary house. The first night there, I got to Skype my mom. At the time, it was very rare that I got to do that, and I told her about how I felt really uncomfortable in the new house. She proposed that it might have been a ghost or a bad energy. I didn't understand any of those terms at the time because I was only nine. She said that we should get someone to get rid of the ghosts. My dad overheard her say that and said she was crazy and made me end the call. My dad tried to make me happy and comfortable by putting a little family photo of us at the end of the hallway with all the bedrooms. That night I dreamed that there was a mosquito in my room, and my first instinct was to kill it. So I clapped my hands really hard on it, but I heard a really deafening sound of glass breaking. I woke up immediately and heard my stepmom in the hallway. I opened my door, and I saw that the family picture was on the complete other end of the hallway and glass was all over the floor. I started then to think that the house really was haunted, but when I mentioned it to my dad, he would get extremely mad at me and send me to my room. Eventually, I started to become depressed. My dad and stepmom got married. Lots of times, our dogs would bark at the wall, but that's probably normal, right? Years later, I mentioned it, and instead of my dad getting mad, he told me that he hid a lot of things from me so as not to scare me. He doesn't believe in ghosts, but he told me that we rented the house from a widow whose husband died very recently before we moved in. He told me about how multiple times my stepmom would wake up to the sight of a man standing at the foot of her bed. It all makes sense, but I don't know how ghosts and stuff work. I'm trying to find some answers for how all of this happened. So if you know anything, let me know. A few years ago, when I was 16 to 17, I worked in a restaurant as a waitress. There were two locations, 
one in my town, which I'll call Restaurant A, and one in a town about 30 minutes away, Restaurant B. I should mention that Restaurant B is located in a rougher area, and many of my co-workers weren't from the best of backgrounds. Nonetheless, they were sweet people, and I trusted them. I was trusted as a manager on Thursdays at Restaurant B, which usually meant that I was the cashier, server, and manager. The only other person would be a cook, who I'll call Dave. In the restaurant, there is a front glass door that customers use and a back wood door. No window in that one. We use that one to take the trash out and things like that. One day, we had no business, and I was in the kitchen with Dave and another cook, who was about to leave. We're standing around talking, with Dave right in front of the back door, the other cook to the side of the door, and me about five feet away from Dave in line with the door. He had a bag of trash in his hand, and he was going to take it out. He opened the door while still facing me and talking. Behind the door was a person. It was clearly a person in a gray t-shirt, jeans, and a black hat. I saw him for a split second, long enough to know that someone was there, and then Dave saw my face and turned around. This blocked my view, and the guy was gone. The other cook saw my face turn white as a sheet when David opened the door and joked that I looked like I had seen a ghost. Oh, the irony. Dave started looking around outside to see what I could have seen. I started actually panicking. I do have severe anxiety and a panic disorder, and Dave was trying to calm me down, but he also seemed really freaked out. He asked me what I saw, and I told him that I had seen someone. I described the person, and what he told me next will never leave me. Dave starts crying and ran out the door with his phone in his hand. He was outside for nearly half an hour, and when he came back in, he was calmer, but still nervous. He told me that roughly 10 years ago, he and his friend were in a horrible car accident, which ended with his friend's death. He told me that the person I described standing outside of the door was wearing the exact outfit his friend had died in. Apparently, I wasn't the first person to see the ghost of his friend. Dave told me that whenever something were to happen to anyone in his family, his friend would show up to either him or his family. For example, one time he saw the ghost of his friend, and literally a minute later his phone rang, and he found out that his father had just suffered a massive heart attack. When he had gone out of the door, he was calling his family to make sure everybody was okay. Luckily they were, but not even two days later, he found out that his wife had miscarried. As if that wasn't weird enough, the same night that I saw the ghost, something else weird happened that I believe was paranormal, but that I understand could also have been paranoia. I was up at the front, at the register, still shaken up, and a huge crow was hovering outside the front door. It was so weird. It literally was just flying in place. It suddenly flew away, and then a really strange-looking man approached the door and opened it wide, but didn't enter. He had the creepiest smile on his face the entire time. Moments later, the crow was back, and it almost came into the restaurant, but another customer swatted it away. The man literally turned around and left, didn't order anything, and never spoke a word. And this happened to me a long time ago. I was probably five or six years old. I was in my grandmother's house. It was morning, and she left me alone for maybe half an hour. I was a very quiet and calm kid, so she had no problems leaving me alone for a little bit. While I was watching TV, I heard some noises coming from the room where my uncle and mother used to sleep when they lived with their parents. It wasn't a particular noise. It was very regular, like if somebody was doing his business inside. I knew I was alone, so I decided to go there and see what was going on. I wasn't afraid of anything, I was just curious. So when I went inside the room, it was all completely normal and empty. But as I was about to leave, 
from the other side of the bed, I saw a figure jumping up, almost like it had been hiding under the bed, with a blanket draped over its shoulders. It was my uncle. He started howling at me, but in a playful way, like you'd do to a kid. So I wasn't scared, but rather entertained, and after a few seconds I left the room. Now, my uncle's old room is at the end of a corridor, and at the sides of this corridor there's my grandma's bedroom and the bathroom. So to go back to the living room where I was watching TV, I passed by my grandma's room, and just like in my uncle's room, he jumped up from the other side of my grandma's bed with the same blanket and the same howling thing. This time, I didn't stop watching. I just saw him while passing by and when I passed by the bathroom, he jumped from behind the door, doing the same thing. After that, I went back on the couch and continued watching TV. I never really spoke about it with my grandma, because back then, I didn't think it was much of a big deal. But as I grew up, this thing really stuck with me, and I can't really explain what happened that day. Obviously, no person could move like that. He would have had to pass me, to get from the first room to the second that I saw him in. Also, my uncle is just fine. He is not dead. And when this happened, he was far away from where my grandma lives. So something that looked like my uncle was in three rooms at the same time. And I have no idea how to explain it. The following story happened to me when I was four years old, and I have no recollection of it. I only know what my family has told me. When I was a kid, my dad worked in Mexico and would visit us about once a month. We lived in a small town in South Texas. One day, before picking him up at the bus station, my mom told my siblings and I to use the bathroom at home so that we wouldn't have to use them at the bus station. My brother and sister say that they saw me walk into the bathroom, but they never saw me walk out. My mom opened the door to check on me, and I was gone. With the layout of our apartment, it would have been impossible for me to walk out without anybody noticing. My mom started panicking and called my grandpa, who was a police officer at the time. Within an hour, multiple police officers and neighbors were searching for me at our apartment complex, with no luck. Three hours later, my godmother found me in my bedroom, sound asleep on my bed. The weird thing is, though, that multiple people searched inside the apartment and hadn't found me anywhere inside. It gets weirder. When they asked me where I was, four-year-old me said that I was in the sky making clouds with a duck using a machine that had a crank that you would spin on one side, then the clouds would come out the other side. I repeated this story for anybody who would listen. I also kept saying that I would see a red light on the television screen for a few weeks after that. I didn't fully believe this story growing up, until I was visiting my grandma in Mexico City years later. She confirmed it, saying that my mom had called her crying right after it happened. My family likes to joke that I was abducted by aliens and then returned home after a few hours. This all happened 31 years ago, and I still have no memories of it at all. So, I'm a delivery driver. About a week ago, I was on delivery and I parked in an after-school daycare parking lot. I was about to get things together when the sky went black for a second. And I don't mean like completely dark, as if I went blind. It's just like all of a sudden it was nighttime. Then, as fast as it had happened, it went back to daytime. I jumped out of the car to see if maybe there was a big plane that had passed over, as if a plane could block out every ray of sunshine. I looked for a cloud or anything that could explain what had just happened. Nothing. I always joke about how we live in a simulation, but maybe this was some kind of proof. Was it UFO interference? Did I jump dimensions for a second? I found a website that had occurrences of groups of people at a time experiencing this phenomenon. 
Weirdly, it usually happens at schools, and I was at a place with lots of kids. Coincidence? I don't know. So, on to the part that made the biggest impression. A few days ago, I was changing out the shower curtain in my bathroom, when I looked up at the shower head and shouted. I had never seen this shower head before. It was huge and really nice. I had a tiny little one. My roomie swears that it's been that way the whole time, but I know it hasn't. I can feel my memories sort of fading away about it. I think my brain is trying to cope with this, so I keep having thoughts like, maybe it was always that way. But I know that I wouldn't have had that reaction to it if it was the shower head I was used to. I've stared at it hundreds of times in the shower. If I jumped dimensions, of course, he wouldn't remember it the way that I do, if that's even remotely possible. I mean, how many times do we jump dimensions and not even know? If there's a dimension for every possibility, then yeah, in one of them Jack Black is my dad, but also maybe just the color of yield signs are a little different, and our brains adapt so we don't lose our minds. I still have no idea what's happening, but I just hope I'm not alone in the weirdness. I have been living in the area for about 19 years now so I know this area and its sites pretty well. There are these two-story houses that I pass very often, even more so in the last four years, as I have to pass them every time I go to university. Nothing really special about them. They're cheaper houses in an estate, like it's not one massive house, but rather two apartments. Anyway, one day, we're on our way back from university, and I look around me and suddenly I notice that something is off. The once vibrant red brick houses are now painted a weird brown color. I could have sworn they were still red just earlier that same day. So obviously at this point I look around in the car and I ask them how they could have painted them so fast. There are about seven of them in a row. My best friend looks at me really weird and says, What are you talking about? At this point, I'm super confused. I continue to tell everybody in the car that those used to be unpainted. But all but one person in the car tells me that I'm just confused. They've always been brown. Upon closer inspection, the paint seems dirty and worn down. Which means it has to have been there for years and years. But it really wasn't. Every time I pass those houses, even now, subconsciously my brain is telling me that it just isn't right, and nobody will believe me. Most people say that I just never really paid attention, but this has been haunting me for years. I hope somebody out there understands what I'm going through. I have been holding on to this story for a while. I wanted to see if maybe anybody had a similar experience. To get this story started, I'll have to jump back in time. Around 2015 or 2016, I was getting ready to go out with my mother and grandmother to go to Hobby Lobby. For those of you who don't know what Hobby Lobby is, it's a store that's full of art and craft items, candles, home decor, stuff like that. It's basically like Walmart for arts and crafts. Anyhow, after I was done getting ready, I sat in my room playing with my parakeet because I had some time to spare. A bit of time had passed and my mother, who I had told to get me when she was ready to go, hadn't come to get me. I walked out into the living room and she was flabbergasted by my appearance. Not because of the way I was dressed, but because I had come out of my room. My mother claimed to have come into my room she said that the lights were off, that she had checked all around for me, and assumed that I went to my grandma's, since she lives right behind my mom's house. I told her that I'd been in my room the entire time waiting for her, and we both felt pretty strange after that. Now, before this entire incident, my mother was very liberal, as well as a few of my other family members. A bit of time passed, and when I woke up one day, everything changed. 
My grandma, who was strictly against tattoos and dyed hair, began participating in both. She got a tattoo and dyed her hair pink. I was highly confused, but I brushed it off as just a change of heart. That was until my mother became this hardcore conservative overnight. It was all just weird. My other grandmother, who didn't like tattoos either, got one. Everything that I grew up with changed overnight. Little by little, I've been noticing more differences in my family from the one I grew up with. I kept trying to make excuses for it, but nothing was fitting. I'm still stuck here in this universe that doesn't feel like my own. I've always been spiritual in the sense that spirits are attracted to me, and I connect with my third eye often. I don't know what to do. I've read these theories that once you hop, you can't go back to where you're from. And this isn't like a political issue. I'm not mad that my mother is conservative or whatever. It's just totally different from the mom I grew up with. Things have gotten weird. Some of my lifelong wishes have come true, but nothing feels right. Ever since I've realized all of this, my brain has gotten strange. I suffer from bouts of disassociation, which at first I thought could have been seizures, except my soul feels like it's floating above my body. Nothing feels like it belongs to me anymore. My body feels foreign, often. It feels as though my soul is trying to connect with a body that it never belonged to. I know I sound crazy, but I'm saying this with 100% honesty from my side. Does anybody know what I can do to adjust? I have memories that nobody in my family remembers, and I tried going to doctors who say I should get a brain scan and tests, but I can't really afford that right now. They say that I'm coherent enough to pass all these tests anyway, but they don't know why I'm having these episodes of disassociation or minor brain seizures if that's what they are. I really, truly believe that this isn't my world. Those close to me can vouch for me that I've been worried about this for a long time. Nobody except for my boyfriend and my closest friends knows about this, but if you have any answers, let me know. Last night, I went to pick up my dog from my dad's house, and something really weird happened. It was around 10 p.m., and I picked up my dog. I've driven from my dad's house at night a thousand times, and I know the road back like the back of my hand. He lives on a ranch, and to get back to the freeway, you have to turn left when the road forks. So I'm driving to the end of this road, but the fork never comes. I keep driving on and on and on, but the road isn't ending. After a good 10 minutes, and note that this road is rather short and should have only taken me about two minutes, the road finally forks. I make a left, and on the side of the road I see glowing eyes, like cat eyes. Then the road just ends into a big ditch. This road should have led to the freeway. I turned around and started driving back, when all of a sudden, a dog jumps on the side of my car. This thing is growling and snarling at the window. This is gonna sound lame, but it's the truth. I got chills and a really bad feeling of dread, and I'm like 90% sure that that was not a dog. I slowed down, panicking, because I thought I was going to accidentally hit this dog. I love dogs, even demonic ones. But then it just disappears. I looked around the car with my flashlight, and this thing was just gone. I floored it out of there and turned back onto what I thought was the main road, and kept driving. I got the GPS to navigate back to my house, and it said that I was a little less than 10 miles away from the freeway. This is literally impossible, because the road that my dad lives on is not that long nor does it lead to any other road that long. I was so panicked that I floored it home, and I forgot to expand the map to see where the heck I was. Once I got home and calmed down, I went on Google Earth to try to see where I went, 
and it doesn't exist. There's not a single road that long, nor anything that resembles what I saw anywhere in that area. I have no clue what happened, and my friend and I are convinced that I traveled into an alternate universe for a little bit last night, that the cat that turned into the dog was a skinwalker. Whatever else, we don't really know. My mother is the sweetest woman. Sometimes she slips money into my wallet for things, even though at this point in my life I don't really need it, thankfully. I recently used my PayPal account to order and ship something for her, because she had forgotten the password to her own account. It cost about $20, and I never thought about it again. She, not surprisingly, left a $20 bill on my kitchen counter a week or so later. I found it after she left, stuck it in my purse, and then went to sleep. I randomly remembered it a couple of days later, and I sent her a quick text message while she was at work that said, Oh, I did find that $20 you left. Thank you. That's all it said. She sent me a message about an hour later that said, That was the cutest picture of you, but now I can't find it. I asked which photo, because of course all I had sent was the text no photo. She said she was busy at work, but on the screen she saw the small unread text and a photo, so she quickly opened it to see the full photo of me. She showed it to her co-worker, so she's not the only one who saw this. She described the photo. She said I was holding a $20 bill right under my face and cheesing hard. She described my shirt and my hairstyle. Here's the thing. She described exactly how I was dressed, and exactly how I had done my hair that day. But I am a million percent sure that I never took a photo, nor did I send her one. Just a thank you text. She was trying to figure out how I could delete the photo after sending it to her phone. If that is possible, I certainly am not capable of doing it, nor would I. All I can think is that there was some kind of glitch. This isn't the first time I've experienced a glitch, but it is the first in a long time, and I just thought I would share. This happened a few weeks ago, but I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. I went for a late night drive, I'm talking 3am, and I was driving alone down this empty road that leads outside of my city. It's a pretty small road two lanes, and it has zero street lights. I have no lights on inside of the car, and I dimmed my dashboard lights to their lowest setting. I did have my high beams on, because of the lack of street lights. As I'm driving along, I see headlights approaching me. So, to be a courteous driver, I switch off my high beams back to the normal setting. I'm bringing this detail up, because after telling several friends this story, they all claimed that it was some kind of reflection. However, when I changed my headlights, the approaching lights did not dim. The headlights ahead of me turned right onto a small road leading into a development under construction. Five seconds later, I drive past the turnoff, and the car is completely gone. There are no cars parked on the street. Nothing. It instantly caught my attention that this car had just vanished. I whipped my car around, and I went into the development that the car had turned into. I drive down to the end of the development, and it's a complete dead end. No other cars are parked in the development. Nothing. This car just vanished. I've driven the road several times since, to see if there was a possibility of a reflection or anything but I cannot replicate it. The car straight up disappeared. I've never thought about glitches in the Matrix as a serious thing, until I started reading more about them. All this time, I've blamed my weird experiences on ghosts. Though I've never seen one, I still believe in them, since my experiences are, at least to me, still unexplainable. I moved into my current house six years ago, 
It's almost a hundred years old, in the oldest neighborhood in my very large city. Weird things would happen, but we would just shrug it off. You know, lights flickering when we would tease each other about ghosts, things falling off the shelves and out of the cabinets, things going missing and then reappearing in weird places, or by weird means. And then, these three events happened. 1. Our living room TV remote disappeared for two years. Then, one afternoon, I was sitting on the couch, picking up little play balls and throwing them to my toddler. I went to pick up another ball, and right in the middle of the ball pile was the remote. It wasn't there when I made the ball pile. I still thought that maybe somehow the toddler had put it there, but I really don't think so. Number two. I used our garden hose, which has a very specific cap on it. I was done with the hose, wound it back up, turned it on to wash my hands off, turned it off, capped it, and walked away. As I was walking away, my roommate walked to the hose and immediately asked where the cap was. I turned, walked the several feet back to the hose, and sure enough, that cap was gone. Not on the ground, not in the bushes, nowhere. I still just thought that maybe somehow it got lost, but that doesn't make a bit of sense. I had just put that cap back on a few seconds before, and nobody else had walked up in that amount of time. Last, but definitely not least, the weirdest incident that actually made me believe it was a ghost was this. I was sitting on one side of the couch, and my roommate was on the other side. He started the movie that we were going to watch. I had an ashtray and a lighter sitting next to me. I put everything down right where it was supposed to go and then leaned the lighter onto the ashtray. A few minutes later, I went to get it again, but the lighter was gone. I figured maybe it slipped between the couch cushions or went somewhere else, but nope. We took all the cushions off and it wasn't there. My roommate picked the entire couch up, and nothing was underneath it. The lighter just... vanished. I ended up having to use a book of matches. After the movie, I went to bed, but I left everything else, minus the lighter, on the couch. I woke up the next morning, but... where I had left my matches was my lighter, laying right in its spot. At first, I was like, let's be reasonable here, and called my roommate. He said that he didn't find or see the lighter, but he remembers the matches because he used one in the morning before he left for work and put them right next to the ashtray. Ever since then, I was convinced that there was a ghost in my house, but maybe these are glitches in the matrix. What do you think? I had a dream about visiting my aunt-in-law's condo that was in Egypt when I was 25 years old. Now I am 29. In the dream, I was sitting on a white couch inside this nice condo, which you might as well call a huge apartment in America. At the time, I didn't even know that I was in Egypt. All I knew was that when you walked onto the porch, there was a desert in a huge city. I started walking around the condo and noticed a huge hole in one of the walls where you can see the elevator moving up and down. This somewhat freaked me out, but I started moving around the place. I looked around the floor. It had a pink marble floor, three bedrooms, a small kitchen, and a small wood floor over by the kitchen where the hole in the wall was. I woke up and started thinking how weird that dream was. Five years later, I find myself in Egypt meeting my girlfriend's family, who's now my wife. The main reason I was there was because of a wedding, and we had other things to do for the wedding there as well. At least, that was the main reason for us being there. I was also there, as I said, to meet the rest of her family. On the last night of my being there, I walked into my aunt's place for the first time. I looked around and thought, this seems really familiar, but I didn't really know why. 
It came time to put my bags down and she took me to the room that I was going to sleep in. Then my wife went out to get her dress for the wedding. They left me in the condo, and as I'm walking around, I started to wonder about why everything looked so familiar. I remembered my dream as I was sitting on the couch, so I start running around and looking everywhere around the place. Everything was exactly the same, minus the hole in the wall where the elevator was. During this time, my new cousin walked in, saw me running around and looking very distressed, and he asked, what's wrong? I said, I had a dream about your mom's house three years ago. I thought it was my Aunt T's place, but it turns out it's your mom's place. It was really weird. I don't know how I saw that place without ever having seen it in real life first. I've always been a believer in both religion and the paranormal. I would see shadows standing outside my door when I was at my dad's house, and I would see and hear the occasional door slam. I never really thought my mom's house was haunted, though. Sometimes things would be out of place, but that's about as far as it would go. This one instance in particular, however, has changed my whole perspective on my mother's home. It was about one in the morning, and I was playing PS4 with some friends from back home. My grandmother was sitting in her lazy boy, and my brother was getting in the shower. We'd just gotten through a game, when all of a sudden I heard an eight-note jingle of We Wish You a Merry Christmas. It sounded straight up like some kind of festive ringtone. I ignored it at first, as I assumed that it was coming from my brother's phone but he always brings his phone with him into the bathroom when he showers, so I didn't know what to think. The source of the sound was coming from the back room just opposite of mine. It was a decrepit old room filled with toys from my childhood, as well as some leftover decorations. I tried to ignore it, but it persisted, growing louder. I finally got up and walked toward the room, hesitantly. I could hear it coming from just to my left side as I was about to enter the room. And then it stopped, without warning. It didn't finish the tune like it was a toy off the rails. It was as if it sensed my presence and just decided to cease. I was both creeped out and dumbfounded. I looked around in that room for at least 30 minutes, but I have seen all of our Christmas decorations and we don't have anything that plays a jingle like that. I know this sounds silly, but I couldn't sleep that night. The air felt a lot heavier, and I just couldn't sleep. I felt something was watching me from that back room. I've tried to find anything that resembles that jingle on YouTube, but to no avail. I mean, surely I've heard we wish you a Merry Christmas, but not the same sound and tone like this thing. I've honestly never heard anything like it. It freaks the hell out of me. Let me just start this off by saying that in our culture, apple trees are said to be cursed. They're said to be homes for children who died young, women who were killed or died while pregnant, and things like that. It is said that if you pick an apple or a leaf off the tree, you're going to have bad luck, or even die. My half-sister lives in an old village in Bosnia, and many deaths happened there, so it would be no surprise that elders said the trees were cursed, and that the kids shouldn't eat the apples that were on them. Apparently in the 30s, a pregnant woman died of blood loss while giving birth underneath that tree, the one that's in front of my half-sister's house. It was common for women to give birth under trees in that village, and it's not a myth because her grave can actually be found in the graveyard, and some of her family members are still alive to confirm it. Anyway, my niece and I, as the foolish kids we were, shook the tree one day until a bunch of apples fell down. We put them in a bucket and ate a couple, and threw the rest into a lake near my half-sister's house, just for fun. Around one month later, I came back to the village for my half-brother's wedding, and saw that the tree was gone. I asked my sister about this, but all she said was, 
There never was a tree there. Everybody knew about this tree. Everybody talked about this tree. But now everybody's acting like it never was there. I am legit so creeped out. This happened to me not long ago, and it confirms to me that our house is haunted. We have had some questionable experiences living here, but this, to me, is a no-brainer. I was walking through the hallway and down the stairs to get to the kitchen, empty thermos in hand, acquiring some water for my girlfriend and myself. When I got to the kitchen, I heard someone coming down the stairs behind me. Knowing people were home, I thought nothing of it. I continued toward the sink, but I turned around just to see who it was. When I got to the sink and had turned all the way around, prominent footsteps faced me and stopped at the bottom of the stairs. There was nobody there. I stood there for a second, wondering if something would appear or walk back up the stairs or something, but nothing. So I filled up the bottle and went back upstairs, and as it turns out, nobody had been up. My girlfriend and I moved to a new apartment about six months ago. From the first night we moved in, I noticed weird things out of the corner of my eye. I see what looks like dark, static figures in our hallway and bathroom. Sometimes the figures move, but they mostly look like they're just standing still. I never see them fully, only out of the corner of my eye. When I turn to look, they vanish. We have a cat and dog who have both acted strangely when it comes to the bathroom. My dog demands to be with me, and if I do not let him, he freaks out, which is something he's never done. Also, our cat will sit in the dark bathroom for hours, also something that is a new behavior. There have also been many times where my dog will start growling or barking at the hall or bathroom. Whatever it is, it usually doesn't do anything physical, except for one time. I had a migraine, so I was sitting in a hot shower with the lights off. Suddenly, the cabinet door under the sink opened and slammed shut. When I looked at it, expecting to find the cat or dog, there was nothing. I was alone. That was several months ago, and it's the only time something physical has ever happened. I told my girlfriend about it, and she agreed the apartment has a weird vibe, but she hasn't seen the figures. I'm just curious if anyone else has experienced this. I feel like the stress is just maybe making me crazy or something. Maybe not. Last night, I had a very disturbing dream. I was driving the car with my wife riding shotgun. My kid was in the back seat. When we reached a sharp curve, I saw the headlights of a large vehicle coming down the wrong side. Turns out it was a bus. I tried to swing my car away from the oncoming bus, but I got hit on the side. We went skidding across the road, and I could see the face of my terrified wife and my son flying in the back seat. Then I woke up, and I had to calm myself down before I could go back to sleep. Just a dream, right? Well, this morning during breakfast, I turned the pages of the local daily over. Then I saw it. There was a story of a family that had gotten killed the night before in an accident, when their car was sideswiped by a bus. The freakiest part, though, is that the car is the same make of mine. The bus is from the same company as the one in my dream, and the location where they got hit was where I was in my dream as well. Am I just trying to fit things into my dream narrative? Or is there something to this? I'm really freaked out. And this happened 14 years ago, and it happened while I was pregnant with my first, when my grandmother, who I was very close to, was dying. Anyway, my ex-husband was on the computer until he heard me screaming and yelling in my sleep. He came to wake me up and calm me down, so I did. He went to go to the bathroom, and while he was washing his hands, he saw in the mirror, which was facing our bed, a girl standing over me, looking at me. I was screaming in my sleep again. He said it was a shadow, and then he saw her walk away and disappear. He couldn't find her and thought it was bizarre, but 
he didn't feel that it was evil. A few months later, he saw her doing the same thing, only this time, I was sleeping peacefully. I had my baby, and my grandmother had already passed away. We had a nightlight in our bedroom so that I could see my way around when getting up to feed the baby. He said that he could see her face more clearly due to the nightlight, but couldn't see who it was. She didn't look at him. She was just staring directly at me while I slept, and then she turned and walked away and disappeared. That was the last time that he saw it happen. What could that be? It's kind of creepy to hear that some girl is just standing by my bed looking at me while I sleep, even if he doesn't think it's evil. It still boggles my mind to this day. The house we had was brand new and we had built it only a year prior, so we have no idea where a spirit would have come from. I know what you're going to think, but I really need you to hear me out. I firmly believe in the existence of aliens, but I'm also very skeptical of evidence that's presented. But after what happened to me, I don't know what to believe. So, a couple of years ago, I had picked up my sister from her school dance, and we were on the drive home. The road we took to get home had no street lights and about three homes along the side of it. This road was in the middle of wine country. It was about 9 p.m. in the winter, so the sun had gone down a while past and the road was pitch black. The road was hilly, so when you reached the top of one of the hills, you could see all the way down the road. There were no other cars on the road. As I was driving, some kind of machine or craft went by about 30 feet in front of my car, from the left side of the road to the right. The speed is not something I can be 100% sure of, but I know that it was going by fast enough that I couldn't make out its shape. All I could see was that it had what appeared to be headlights on all sides, no brake lights in the back. It had to be about six to eight feet long, but again, it went by so fast that I cannot be positive on that number. At first, I dismissed it as some kid riding around on a dirt bike or an ATV, on the right side of the road was a huge field, so I figured that once I got to where it had gone by, I would have been able to see whatever it was in the field. I reached where the craft had gone, but there was nothing. I drove around a bend where you could see the whole field, and there was nothing to be seen. I was and am so confused about what I saw that night. I mean, maybe it could have been somebody on a bike or a cart, but I've never seen any man-made vehicle that has white headlights on all sides, that moves that fast, and that can disappear in moments. I had just gotten back from the beach, and I went inside the house, looking for my grandmother. The door was unlocked, and she never leaves without locking the door. I didn't see her on the couch, and her bedroom door was not closed, so I knew she wasn't taking a nap, but it was just odd that she wasn't on the couch or the front porch. I glanced at the table, and there was no note. I called for her, and I heard a kind of muffled sound that I thought might have been a muffled call for help. I ran to the back. I didn't see her on the bed, so I ran to the bathroom, and she wasn't there either. I called again for her, and I didn't hear anything, so I looked around the bathroom once more, and then back to the bedroom. I swear that I saw her laying on the floor in the bedroom. I saw her long enough and well enough to see what she was wearing, a blue sweater and jeans. I blinked, and she wasn't there. For a moment, I thought I just imagined it, so I ran to the front of the house and looked around. I thought maybe I should go get my mom. This time, though, I saw my grandma's neon yellow notepad on the kitchen table, so bright that it was impossible not to see, and there was a note saying she'd gone across the street for a second. I looked at that table, and there was no note before. I felt so disoriented and confused for a second. I went back outside, and there was my grandmother with the neighbor. She was wearing a completely different outfit, too. I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want to freak anybody out. 
I just kind of hope whoever that other person I saw got help passing on, or whatever they needed. Long story short, I signed my grandma up for a clothing subscription. You know, the kind that you fill out a questionnaire and a stylist picks things out for you and sends them to you in the mail. You try them on and keep what you like. It's like a subscription box. Anyway, my grandmother called me and said that she wanted to keep everything, so I logged into her account to mark everything. Guys, I shit you not. The sweater that my grandma was wearing when I had seen her on the floor? She received it in that pack. I'm kind of freaking out. I want to tell her, but again, I also don't want to come off like a weirdo. I mean, she already knows I'm weird, I just don't want her to think I'm that kind of weird. I guess I'm safe for a while because it's the summer and that's definitely a winter top, but I don't know. It makes me nervous. About two years ago, I had a dream where my friend and I, I'll call him John, were at an old abandoned barn seemingly in the middle of nowhere. We were on the outside of the barn just talking when dusk started to set in. So I told John that I had to be going or I would be late. I started down the path that led around the barn to wherever I knew I had to be going. I remember it just being a simple dirt path with a simple wooden fence running along the left-hand side of it, leading into a wood line about 100 to 200 yards away. As I turned the path around the barn, I looked up and noticed a humanoid figure in the middle of the path, about 20 yards away. Naturally, I was startled, so I turned to John. For some reason, he'd been following me, and I hadn't questioned it, to ask if he saw it too, but he was gone. I turned back and the figure stood in the same spot. For some reason I continued along until I got about 5 to 10 feet from it and was able to suddenly make out its features. The moment I looked upon the figure close up, I recognized it immediately as Death or the Grim Reaper as traditionally pictured. But it was unlike any iteration I'd ever seen or have seen since. It had your typical dark hooded robe, but its skull-like face shimmered like an emerald in the sunlight, with two small red orbs in its eye sockets. The part that I remembered disturbing me the most was his friendly smile that stretched from ear to ear. His mouth and teeth were like a bottomless pit of darkness, and his teeth resembled that of a shark. The part that I think really caught me off guard was when he spoke. He had what I remember being a surprisingly normal voice. It was actually fairly pleasant to listen to. His words are the main thing that still puzzle me, because I feel like there's some meaning to them. After making eye contact and smiling, he told me, you're a day late for judgment. And that's when I woke up. It's the only dream in my life that I remembered that vividly when I awoke and the only dream or thought that I've ever been compelled to write down. I still carry that page folded up in my wallet. Does anyone have any theories as to what this might mean, if anything? I told my friend who was in the dream, and he thinks it's connected to the time when I was about 14. I drowned in the reservoir, but I was pulled back out by my brother, and I came back. The last thing I remember from drowning was letting go and a peace overcoming me before I blacked out, then nothingness before I awoke on the boat with my brother over me. My brother estimated I had been underwater for at least a few minutes before he managed to get to me. Maybe I was supposed to have died then and didn't. Maybe that's why I'm late for judgment. Whatever the reason, I'm very interested to hear what anybody else might think. I work at a small 48-bed hospital. These experiences happen in or near the decommissioned psych wing. IT, in which I work, was moved to this wing, into old patient rooms. At first, I'd hear my name called, often from down the hall or from empty rooms. Thinking someone needed tech support, I would try to locate the caller, but there was never anyone there. 
Many times I would see people in empty rooms, a patient on a bed, a doctor in a white lab coat next to them. As this was a decommissioned wing, it made me turn around to investigate, only to find the rooms empty. Frequently, there was a male and a female walking together, apparently talking to each other, and they would turn into the room next to mine. I would follow them, only to find that they had entered a room through a closed door, and no one was inside. It was always the same room, too. One afternoon, on a Saturday, I got called in while my four-year-old daughter and I were downtown. I headed over, but was unable to unlock the notoriously problematic back door to our wing. However, I saw a man coming down the hallway toward me, and I knocked on the door and motioned that I was locked out. He appeared to look right at me, but instead of coming to my aid, made a right-hand turn into the office next to mine. I quickly leaned forward to better see, and hurriedly knocked on the door, thinking he hadn't seen or heard me, only to realize the door to that office was closed. Confused, I thought maybe I had just seen a reflection in the window from behind me, and turned, asked my daughter if anyone had walked up behind us, and she said no. I was able to get the door open finally, and the office was empty. Another time, our wing was fully occupied due to a remodel which displaced some staff. I heard what I thought was a metal cart coming down the hall, and then a tremendous crash like a dozen pots and pans hitting a tile floor. I jumped up and ran into the hallway, partly to assist, and partly to make sure nobody was hurt. No one on our floor had heard anything. There was no cart, and no disaster. Next, I was called in on New Year's Eve, before midnight. The issue took about 20 minutes to resolve, and since I was going to miss the festivities anyway, I thought I would document my time and head home. Upon entering my office, I noticed the bathroom door was open several inches, which I always keep closed. This wasn't a big deal. Housekeeping had probably left it open while cleaning up. For some reason, I did not close it as I normally would have during the day. As I typed up the incident, a man exited my bathroom. At first I thought perhaps my boss had come to investigate as well, but then why would he have been in my office? As I looked up, the man, just over six feet tall and thin, looked over at me in shock, as I must have been doing to him, and then he disappeared. Considering the hour, I noped out of there without finishing my report. The old TVs in the rooms of this wing would sometimes turn on by themselves, just static, as they had no feeds, but I had to unlock empty patient rooms and turn off the televisions occasionally, always with the volume turned up to the max. One other co-worker has told me that he has heard his name called when no one is there, has seen the woman walking down the hall but without the man, and the doctor by the bedside, but that's all. Many people will report hearing things they can't explain, but no one else has told me that they can see anything. The rest of the hospital has no abnormal activity that we know of. For years, my mom worked in a hospital that had been abandoned and recently torn down. She worked there for a long time, and it's the reason that she believes in the paranormal. Nothing too scary happened to her, but the events definitely stuck, because they're always her go-to ghost stories when reconnecting with past co-workers. The first one is one night while cleaning. She was organizing papers in what they called the kitty psych. It wasn't necessarily used as a psych ward, just where they put the kids so that they weren't near the actual ward for inmates. Only her and another nurse were on that floor, and she could hear her in the kitchen doing dishes. Mom was in a small room, so there was no way that she would not have seen somebody enter. She felt the heaviness of a person walking past, 
and knew that it wasn't the other nurse, because, as I said, she could still hear her in the kitchen. The second incident has a little backstory. When the original owner fell ill, she was in a hospital room in her own hospital, and had to pass ownership to her sons. She was unhappy with a lot of what they did to her hospital, and sadly passed knowing that the building she loved so much was going to go to crap. Well, when she passed, the door to her hospital room would slam repeatedly any time her sons made a decision she didn't like. It went from being terrifying to sort of a joke. When the door would slam, you'd almost always hear a nurse respond with, Mama Mansoor is unhappy with her boys. You could also hear people running in the wards, despite the doors being heavy and unable to be opened without a key. You could stand in the hall and feel the heaviness of people running around you. Maybe not the scariest, but everybody I know loves hearing my mom's haunted hospital stories, so I figured I would share them with you. A couple of years back, I was struggling and constantly in and out of mental hospitals. Don't let this make you question my credibility, though. It was just for depression and anxiety stuff. I was never prone to hallucinations or anything like that. But anyway, I was in a hospital that was really, really old. Used to be a farm like a hundred years ago. My roommate decided to make a makeshift Ouija board with a piece of paper and a bottle cap. I was like 15 and didn't believe in ghosts or anything, so I went with it, thinking that nothing would happen. I was very wrong. So the two of us sat in our room and we were asking questions. I had had some odd and possibly supernatural experiences at this hospital before, but I still didn't believe before this happened. I was getting exasperated and I told my roommate to stop messing around and stop moving the bottle cap. Well, she took her hands off, so I was the only one with my hands on it. Then I asked another question. The cap shook a little, but I thought it was just me, because my hands shook. Then I asked a question, and the cap started shooting around and went off the paper. It was just going nuts. Needless to say, I said goodbye. I was completely shocked, and I've been a believer ever since. This happened to my mother, who had been admitted to hospital in the summer of 2018, after she was suffering from pain in her abdomen, caused by ulcers in her stomach which were later removed. In her ward, there was one other patient, a very elderly lady who seemed to be out of it, to be perfectly honest. Her ward had four hospital beds, two beds facing the other two beds across the room, with two windows to the far side. One night, my mother remembers a chair, which was used by visitors of the patients being opposite her bed. She awoke the next morning to find that exact chair right by her bedside, as if somebody had visited her in the night and left it there in its position. Even if it was a doctor checking up on her, they wouldn't sit down on the chair or leave it there in that position. My grandfather passed away in 1994 and didn't get to see any of his grandchildren. I wonder sometimes, was this my grandfather showing a sign? So, I was working at this hospital called Warren General, in Warren, Pennsylvania, about 90 minutes east of Erie. I worked the night shift. I'm a travel RN, so this was one of the hospitals that I traveled to. One night, my floor was so slow that I got pulled down to the CCU to work. Well, that night, my patient rang her call bell at 3 o'clock in the morning. She asked me, what does she want? I said, what do you mean? She said, the nurse that keeps coming in here and standing there in that corner. 
She pointed to the corner behind the door. I said, who, Ashley? The nurse that I was working with, and I pointed to her, sitting in the nurse's station. She says, no, the other one. Well, there was no other one. It was just the two of us. The patient was a woman in her fifties with no history of mental illness, and she wasn't taking any medication that would make her hallucinate. So I kind of laughed, and I said, it's just us. She just stares at me, so I say, Okay, well if she does it again, just yell for me and I'll come right in. Her room was eight feet in front of the nurse's station. So about a half hour goes by and she yells, See, there you go again. I got up, started walking, and I heard the bathroom door shut. It had been cracked open just a little bit, to give her dark room a little bit of light. I walked in and I said, See, you're dreaming. No one else is here. She says, no, she's here. She went into the bathroom. So I opened the door, light still on, and there's no one there. Looking confused, I say, um, w what does she look like? I thought maybe somebody was messing around. It's too dark to tell. I can tell it's a woman, but she's so dark, I can't really make out her face. So when she says that, I get a little weirded out. But the night ends, and I forget about it. Three months go by. I get pulled back down to the same unit. I have the same room as before. This time, it's a man in his early 60s. He's a nice guy, alert, oriented, and very polite. The night's going really well. It's about 3 a.m., and his call light goes off, which of course means that he needs something. So I walk in and he says, you are my nurse, right? And I shook my head yes. He said, well then why does that lady keep coming in here and standing in the corner? What is she doing? What? I almost shit myself instantly. This was three months later, in the same room, the same thing. I said to him, honestly, I think it's a ghost, sir. And he laughs. I said, no, really, you're not the first one to say that. I started telling everybody about it then, and I found out that the entire second floor has a nurse that's seen every once in a while. I guess in the 1990s, a nurse who worked up there killed herself. In fact, she shot herself in the second floor bathroom. A friend of mine worked in a hospital she called me up one day to talk about strange things that were happening. She worked night security, and during this time, an older part of the hospital was being renovated. She would notice things, like the sound of someone walking behind her, equipment being moved around, the doors opening and closing, doors to patient rooms would jerk open. She was getting scared and asked me to come with her one night. I got permission to walk with her. I saw the doors open and close, and I even heard someone talking in one of the patient rooms. This side of the hospital was closed off. She, I, and one other security guard were the only people there that night. I took a ton of photos and videos. On one of the videos, you can hear footsteps, and on one video, you could see a door creak open a bit, all on its own. All of that was all right, but this scared the hell out of me. During one of the videos, I could plainly see a figure of a woman walk out from a room. She stood next to the nurse's desk. It was very quick. I was moving my phone from side to side. I didn't see her with my naked eyes, so I didn't know to pause. She had a bluish tint to her. She had a jacket, a skirt, and kind of a beehive hairdo, and glasses. My friend showed the picture to some of the nurses. A few of the older nurses said it looked like a girl who used to work there, and also died at the hospital. One nurse jumped up. Oh my gosh, that looks just like Maggie. She said that Maggie worked in the hospital in the early 70s, 
and died there from cancer. I wish I still had the pictures and the videos, but my phone was stolen before I could upload them. But my phone was stolen before I could get all the footage off. Either way, it was a pretty terrifying experience, but kind of cool too. So my friends and I visited this abandoned place in Slovakia. The asylum was first opened in 1918 as a spa center. Later, it was rebuilt as an asylum and closed in the 1970s. It is said that patients were tortured here and many experiments were done on them. So I took a lot of pictures and recorded about 15 minutes of videos. We've experienced strange sounds. Something made a lot of noise, but we didn't make anything of it at first. After the noise, we said, do that again if you're here, but nothing happened. But then as we were leaving, something made a noise behind me, and my friend said he could feel a cold touch on his back. So we finally left the place and looked at the photos. There's something on the photos that I need to debunk, or not. I enhanced the photos already, so you can see better. The links will be in the description. I'd love to hear your opinions about them. I don't know what we saw, but I'd love to debunk it or confirm what it is.